Um, I'm going to do a real brief introduction, but uh, for those of you that don't know, I'll tell you a little bit of the history of this. Um, so, uh, a student by the name of Matt Leinhauser, who is um, in the Honors College, and uh, he's due to graduate in May. Last year, he, um, as part of his capstone project, he <coughs> wanted to create a, an opportunity for faculty who were retiring to um, have an opportunity to kind of share what we call the last lecture kind of thing. And so, last year would be the um, inaugural, and we had um, two faculty members, Dr. John Healy, who's in the crowd here. Um, we could, I don't know, clap? What was his name? <laughs> so he gave one last year, and then also Dr. Brent Thompson gave one last year as well. So then this would be the second year, and then we learned of Dr. Shorten's retirement. Um, it felt very fitting and very appropriate for, um, for us to do this again, and he graciously agreed, and so we're really fortunate to uh, to have him here with us for this. So, um, he, Dr. Short has had quite a distinguished career, and I um, won't go into all of the accomplishments, and there are many, um, but I will say that it's been my pleasure to kind of be a colleague of his for the last, I think, 17 years or so. I'm a little envious. I'd love to be in that retirement kind of uh, <laughs> position, but we'll get there eventually. Um, but I will say this. Uh, a teacher affects eternity, and therefore he can never tell where his influence will stop. And that's a quote from Henry Adams, and I think that that's kind of a really fitting quote for tonight, this evening, um, as Dr. Shorten gets to share with us wisdom, insight, um, experience, and, and a whole lot of good stuff that we can all probably take notes from, learn, grow, etc. Um, I think. In the department, we have two strategic priorities. They're both collaboration and student-centeredness or student success. And I certainly think that Dr. Shorten embodies um, both of those really, really well throughout his accomplishments. So if you don't mind, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shorten as part of his legacy lecture. So this marks my uh, 30th year at Westchester, and I thought that was a good note to go out on. Uh, I want to make this presentation a thank you to uh, my many students, my colleagues, and to the university itself. So I will uh, start with one introductory slide here. Sort of an overview of what I'd like to present. And, and I thought about this as what it, what it means to be a faculty member at WCU. And it looks kind of like what we tell all of our young faculty members when they first come to the university, that you need to engage in research, teaching, and service. So I thought a little bit about what those things mean to me. Research is where we create new knowledge, uh, but we have to build that knowledge on the uh, work of our predecessors. But we challenge paradigms to come up with new information, new knowledge. We analyze and interpret our data to try and explain the unknown. Uh, that's sort of my idea of what research is. Uh, in teaching, we're entrusted with the future. We have the opportunity to uh, try and mold new ways of thinking. Um, and with our students, it's not so much about the answers, but we need to make sure that they're asking the right questions. So if we get them to that point, I think we've done a successful job in our teaching. Uh, we try to make sure that our students are able to take society and move it forward, to thrive and survive. Uh, the third piece of what we do as faculty members at Westchester is service. And that's where we share our knowledge and our abilities with uh, others to, I think it's sort of a little bit more present focused. And uh, we, by definition, we serve our university on committees, uh, and that's something that uh, we do a lot of. We serve our profession, we serve our community. 
And by our actions and deeds, I think we're showing our students what it takes to be a responsible citizen. So we're trying to uh, lead by example. So I thought I'd go all the way back to the beginning of my research career, and I had a really wonderful opportunity as an undergraduate. I met this man, Professor Bruce Parker, when I was a biology major back in 1978 is when I met him. And uh, he told me all about his research in his classes. And I was fascinated because he was an ecologist studying Antarctic algae. So he went to the uh, Antarctic, and studied the algae that exists beneath these primitive lakes. So a few of the images here are our research site, and I had a really great opportunity to travel to the Antarctic and spend four months doing research in the Antarctic. And uh, after that, he gave me a job when I came back from the university. Uh, I spent about 20 months working in his lab, and while I was there, I started in on my master's degree. My master's degree uh, took me over to the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, where I studied uh, some roles between algae and bacteria, sort of an outgrowth of the work I had done with Bruce Parker. Uh, and I looked at them in a drinking water context to see how that might uh, create some disinfection byproducts. These are chemicals that uh, form in the drinking water plant that are undesirable, of course, because they're uh, carcinogens. So this was, at the time, an emerging drinking water supply issue. And I have a picture of my mentor down there, Dr. Robert Hohen, uh, from Virginia Tech's Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Uh, from there, I moved on to Clemson University, and uh, I studied coal and the chemicals that wash off of coal. And so uh, I was mentored again by Dr. Alan Elserman, who uh, to this day is a good friend of mine, uh, an excellent mind, a brilliant scholar, and he took me all over the United States to conferences and was just a fabulous mentor, a uh, bit of a role model for me with my own students. And uh, the title of that work was Desorption Kinetics of Polycyclic Aromatic Hydrocarbons in Coal Fines and Coal Contaminated Sediments. Sounds like a typical PhD title, but it really was a water quality <coughs> focused project looking at uh, the chemicals that wash off the coal into water. So from there, by then I, I knew, I said that an academic career is what I absolutely wanted. I, I, was uh, convinced of that even before I started the PhD, but I had such a wonderful experience at Clemson that uh, that was what I wanted to do. So in 1989, I came to Westchester University. So that's 30 years ago. Uh, since then, I've mentored 34 different master's student projects. Uh, some of those folks are here tonight. I think, uh, as I look down the list, uh, uh, Jay Neff is here. Um, uh, Christina Early is here. I think I see Corinne Neumeister. I see uh, there's uh, well, some of the earlier ones are not here. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see those students here. It's always a nice reminder. So you don't have to read all these titles. I'm just trying to impress you because it looks like so many when I put the slide together. I'm like, wow, that's really cool because it's a lot of students. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of really wonderful projects and, and great experience working with these people. Um, a couple of folks here that uh, went all the way through uh, both bachelor's and master's with us include uh, Amy Braunlin. Amy got her bachelor's degree in environmental health with us and then stayed on uh, after a couple years of work for her MPH. Uh, over here we have uh, Jade Neff. Jade uh, got her bachelor's degree. Jade's here tonight. She got her bachelor's degree with us. She got her master's degree with us. And uh, she currently teaches a couple courses for us. In the lower left is Jim Galloway. Uh, Jim has a similar story. He got his bachelor's degree with us. Uh, I took him and his bachelor's work to the uh, American Public Health Association. He received some awards for his work, so I think I have another slide of him a little bit later. And a few of my other graduate students. And there's the one of me with the most hair. So I promised my, <laughs> I promised my students, I said, we're all a lot younger in some of these pictures, and I even had a full head of hair. <laughs> Gotta say. It. A couple of graduate students, uh, two of which are here. Here's Christina Early. Christina got her bachelor's degree with us. She got her master's degree with us, and she has placed several of my interns. In fact, I just introduced her to one of my colleagues, and she's uh, talking to him about that process even further. Um, 
Jennifer Milikini is also here. Jennifer got her master's degree with us. She has mentored, I believe, five additional graduate students since she finished, either four or five of mine, who have all worked on various water quality projects. And uh, Christine Brisbane has been a, a repeat visitor to my classes. She's an expert microbiologist in terms of water quality and uh, some other images of students at work in water quality. So of course, a research um, component without undergraduates uh, is not really possible. And I learned a lot from my undergraduates over the years. Um, one course that I taught a number of times, as I taught EMB 455, it's our environmental health seminar course for seniors. I taught that course 23 times over the last 30 years to a total of 214 students. And each one of those students uh, conceptualized, uh, designed, collected data, analyzed data, and they brought those projects all the way through to a final report. Um, so this course was designed to introduce undergraduates to the research process, but I got the idea pretty quickly that a lot of them were, were very much naturals of this. So I learned that undergraduates make great researchers. Uh, they great, make great colleagues. Uh, they can produce research that's on par with students from some of the biggest universities in the nation. They can go on and present that undergraduate research at national institutions. They can receive awards for it. And they can receive publication in journals for it. So I'm, I'm truly impressed and have always been impressed with the skills and the abilities of my undergraduates. Just a couple pictures. I'm trying to make this very, uh, you know, it's obviously a walk through memory lane for me as well. But here we see some students from my seminar class in 2001, 2003, uh, 2010, 2012. I think I've got quite a few more on the next slide. 13, 14, 15, 16, and I was on sabbatical in 17, so that's why there's no photograph there. Uh, 2018. So these are some of the young people that I've had. Uh, the pleasure of working with over the years in terms of mentoring their, their senior research project. And they do good work. So I'd like to highlight uh, some of the awards that my students have won. Starting at the bottom, uh, some, a couple of these are graduate student projects, but most of these are undergraduate projects, so my title is a little misleading. Uh, Linda McGarvey did her master's thesis with me and completed in 1998. And uh, she went on and received a uh, full scholarship to take that paper to the national uh, meeting of the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry in North Carolina. Uh, Jeff Thomas uh, wrote a paper as an undergraduate that received an award at the uh, Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry in New Jersey. Uh, Jim Galloway. Uh, did an award-winning paper at the research day at, at Westchester, and so he then took that paper on to the American Public Health Association meeting. Christina Early received a, uh, an award to take her paper to the National Environmental Health Association meeting in Cincinnati, as did Tom Powell, Amanda Buehling, and this year I'm pleased that I have one final winner. We all are still here at Westchester. Nick Antonio is going to be taking his paper to the National Environmental Health Association meeting in Memphis this coming summer. So I'm very proud of all these students and their ability to bring research to this remarkable endpoint. Hopefully I'm not done with research. I have a couple unfinished projects. So what's unfinished? Um, a few years ago I published, well many years ago now, I published a five-year history and then a little bit later a 12-year history of hazardous material management in Chester County, Pennsylvania. This was an outgrowth from some of my service work with the uh, Chester County Department of Emergency Services. And uh, so now they'd like me to collaborate and put together a 20-year, 25-year retrospective. So I'll be working on that uh, paper with my colleagues from the Chester County Department of Emergency Services and the local emergency planning committee. Um, in the uh, photograph here, I have my uh, most recent and I'll say my final MPH graduate, Allison Parente. Allison also got her bachelor's degree with us and went on and got her master's degree. And uh, here are, is Allison presenting her poster uh, at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuaries Science and Environmental <coughs> Summit in Cape May, New Jersey, and she presented that just this past January. So I've got a lot of data on the Brandywine Creek. Uh, some of which I've published in a couple places, but I want to kind of pull it together and, uh, and put together a, a more uh, definitive work on that. The 
thought about this. Now I'm thinking about this because we're trying to find somebody to replace me. So that's that's an awkward position to be interviewing your replacement. Uh, so we've been asking all these candidates interview questions. I thought, well, gee, my interview question in 1989 was this: What is the most pressing environmental problem we face today? And I was asked to give a presentation to my colleagues, future colleagues at that point, uh, about this topic. So uh, what had just happened in 1989, of course was this one over here. The Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound in Alaska. And that happened in March of 1989, and I was probably on, on the stage in front of the, my future colleagues in April of 1989. So this was very fresh in all of our minds. I was working in an area at that point of uh, oil tank cleanup. And of course, just a year before, this was a big incident in Pennsylvania where uh, an above ground storage tank had collapsed and dumped a million gallons of diesel oil in the Monongahela River over by Pittsburgh. And so, my working in oil and these two big oil spills, and aha, that's of course the signature environmental issue. We've got to get control of these oil spills. And that's what I thought was most important in 1989. And I guess my colleagues agreed because they hired me. And so based on, uh, based on that work, I came to the faculty at Westchester. Well, I thought, uh, thinking about this, what if I were asked the same question today? What would I say? And this actually, uh, this idea also popped into my head while we were talking to our candidates because uh, we're asking them to have some expertise in this area. So I believe that the most pressing environmental issue today is carbon dioxide emissions and global climate change. It's the elephant in the room. It impacts so much of what we do, and it's going to continue to impact our next generation of students. So uh, we see unprecedented carbon dioxide levels. We see rates of change that we've never seen before in human history. Um, so I think we have a very clear case that this global climate change is, is something we need to get a handle on, and perhaps we need to get a handle on it yesterday. Okay, so teaching is a huge part of what we do at Westchester. Uh, over my career, I've taught 19 different courses, 236 three-credit sections to 5,798 students. How did I get these stats? Well, we have a great database. I spent one Sunday afternoon prepping for this lecture, and I went all the way back to 1989, and I counted every course I taught, and I counted all the students, and then I just kept going, and about three hours later, I had these stats. So. Uh, some of these courses I taught uh, only once or twice, some of them I taught quite a bit. So um, I thought I'd highlight a few of them. Uh, one of my favorite classes, this is going to be the last course that I'll teach. I'm going to teach it in summer session and then I'm done. Uh, so far I've taught 14 sections to 216 students. The environmental regulations course I've taught 14 times to 306 students. 16 sections of risk assessment to 294 students, and hold on, 123 sections of humans and the environment to 3,723 students. I didn't think that was possible, but obviously this has been a huge part of my career. And so I really do consider that an important part of my legacy to have been able to bring uh, environmental awareness to so many people uh, who may not even, uh, many, most of whom are not going to pursue a career, anything related to environmental health or environmental science, but of course, I hope they've left my class as a better environmental citizen. That's kind of a scary number. <laughs> just a couple more pictures. I, can, I, I just love pictures of students when they're happy, when they're working. Uh, obviously, graduation is a pretty cool time for students, so we've got, uh, um, my colleague Mara Sheehan here at, at graduation, she was always really good at going to graduation, so when she retired, I went, oh, I've got to step up my game. I've got to make sure I get to all of these. Um, I believe this one is from two years ago, or maybe just, okay, I don't remember what here. Uh, here I have one of my interns at work in the water treatment plant. Again, she was mentored by our MPH graduate, Jennifer Milakivi. A group of students at a conference where we were looking at some ecological issues. And of course, uh, we've taught hazardous waste operations to all of our students. It's a required course. And one of the favorite things is the dress out activity. Could not have done any of this without my colleagues. What a great group of colleagues I've had over the years. Uh, the Environmental Health Program was started in the late 1970s by Roger Mustalish, at that time a faculty member in the Department of Health and Physical Education. That's what it was called. Okay, and uh, shortly after Roger formed that program, he brought Mara Sheehan on board. Mara's here tonight. 
Uh, Mar and I worked closely together for probably about 27 of my 30 years here. Um, Neha Sunger and Lorenzo Chena are full-time faculty members now. Uh, just, just really brilliant minds, and I think I'm going to be leaving the environmental health program in really good hands. Uh, a couple of adjuncts that have contributed quite a bit to our courses include Jim Galloway, Michael Werner, Joy Warnesich, and Steve Felna. Steve's here tonight. Steve is still teaching for us, and um, pretty much all these folks are still teaching for us. Can I ask any of my colleagues that are here to stand up, please? Okay. Let's give them a round of applause. Along the way, we earned two accreditations. I think Westchester University has 13 accredited programs, 13 different accreditations across the uh, whole institution, and Environmental Health has two of those, so that's a pretty good accomplishment. Our undergraduate degree is accredited uh, with the uh, National Environmental Health Science and Protection and Accreditation Council, and our graduate master's program uh, due also to a lot of hard work on the part of my colleagues in public health and other areas in the health department. We're accredited through the Council on Education and Public Health. So those are uh, outside validations of the value of the work that we do and what we bring to our students. I thought I'd just show a couple pictures and talk a little bit more about some of the courses I've taught over the years. I have to start with this one. This is my favorite course. I, I hope it's my students' favorite course, too. It's called Water Quality and Health. And I designed it back, the first time I taught it was 2002. I designed it back then as a hands-on course to get students out doing field work, to get them in the laboratory. So it's a blend, it's a mixture of field and lab and lecture. And uh, so uh, we do a multi-day field trip. We go up and down the Brandywine Creek from the headwaters to the mouth, collecting samples, doing lab analysis, and uh, cataloging the status of the Brandywine Creek. A couple more pictures from that, uh, from that course. Uh, lots of happy students, obviously, plenty of group photographs uh, along the way, doing uh, work in the creeks and the streams that feed into the Grand One. So, uh, very pleased to have had the opportunity to work with all these people. I also uh, spent a good bit of time doing study abroad uh, in the middle of my career. And it started with uh, a really wonderful opportunity I had to have a Fulbright scholarship in India in 2006. Um, the upper left-hand picture is me with my group of Indian students at the Delhi College of Engineering. Uh, when I returned, I said, I, I want to somehow give back, and I want to share the international learning experience with my students. So I led two different trips to Costa Rica in 2008 and one again in 2009, and uh, then also uh, to China in 2008. So I'm going to show you a few images from those trips and some of the things that we did and learned while there. So uh, the Delhi College of Engineering was the site of my Fulbright scholarship. I was there for six months. I taught two courses while I there was there. I taught a course in general environmental health to some graduate students, and I taught a course in soil and water conservation engineering to my undergraduates, which eventually, when I came back to Westchester, became my stormwater management class. Um, so this is at the front gate of the Delhi College of Engineering, just a few images from the campus there. Uh, this is the building where I taught and worked. This is the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, this is the classroom. So it's a modern building, but the classroom was pretty rough. So uh, it had uh, all the old equipment moved from their old campus to the new campus, and I'm sure by now it's been upgraded quite a bit. I think the campus was maybe a year or two old at this point, so they were scrambling to get some furniture and lab equipment still. Uh, here's a group of my students. Again, this was from the soil conservation class, and they were tasked with building some models of stormwater diversion structures, and here they are pouring water to demonstrate how these types of structures might work. And this is the graduating class of 2006 uh, with an environmental engineering degree, so the faculty are all seated across the front, and then we had, I think, about 17 students in that graduating class. So these were all very good friends of each other, a uh, very dynamic group of young people. Uh, it was uh, a joy to teach them as well. And I learned a lot because I found out in an Indian classroom that when you say, uh, you ask a question, well, what do you think is, and before I can even finish the question, I had 17 hands in the air. They all wanted to answer my question. And it was wonderful. And so, uh, I, and they would all answer at the same time. And I, Trying, okay, let's let's go one at a time. But it was just wonderful. The participation was 
was huge, and, and uh, I still uh, uh, keep track of a couple of these students. Uh, the Fulbright program encourages its scholars in country to travel around, so I'll just have to show a couple of beautiful travel pictures. I got the opportunity to travel up the Ganges, uh, to the source of the Ganges, up into the Himalayas, and uh, this is uh, as, about as far up as we got into the mountains on a multi-day trek. Uh, I was traveling through Rajasthan, and of course, I'm an amateur musician, and I can't pass up a brass band mounted on camels. Uh, so that's not something I see too often in the, in the U.S., like never. Uh, they took us to the uh, Golden Temple, which is the capital of the Sikh faith, uh, in Amritsar, near the border with Pakistan. And uh, this is the Golden Temple in Amritsar, in north western India, in the state of Punjab. Thank you. Okay. And I got to take a little hike on, on the desert with this guy. Some of these photographs were taken by my wife, and some are by some are by me. And so I have to, in advance, you know, say, okay, it's kind of a mixed bag. I don't know who's with who's. Um, but we met some wonderful people. We had some guides who led us around, and we saw some really interesting things. These are fishermen uh, in the Bay of Bengal. They're returning after laying about a mile of net to bring back a whole net full of fish that are about this big, maybe an inch long. Um, and uh, so I thought that was a very interesting image of rural life. I spent my six months in India mostly by myself. It was an exhilarating time. It was a lonely time. I had two weeks uh, when my wife came and visited me. Best two weeks in India. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we did make it to uh, the Taj Mahal. My next study abroad took me to Costa Rica in 2008. Uh, I designed this as a semester-long course, but we had traveled to Costa Rica in the middle of spring break. We visited several regions. Uh, just to highlight some of the things that we saw and did, we visited the cloud forest in Monte Verde. Uh, we saw some of the uh, volcanic uh, activity there in Costa Rica. Uh, we visited a school and spent an afternoon with some school children and uh, enjoyed uh, spending some time with them. And we also explored a watershed uh, that uh, had some unique water quality issues. So I had a few undergraduates and a few grad graduates in this course, so it was kind of a mixed bag course, and that was a great first uh, taking students abroad experience. <coughs> oh, but you know, I don't want to do that by myself. Now I had Pat with me. That, that is my travel mom. So when I would take students abroad, I needed somebody else to help with all of the logistics of having all these young people in a foreign country. And uh, that was indispensable with that. I didn't want to do the teaching part again by myself, uh, so I teamed with uh, Professor Ana Sanchez here in Foreign Languages. And uh, she and I uh, devised a series of two courses, six credits, where the students would take a 200 level Spanish course. We made it professional Spanish. I said, here's all the environmental terminology I'd like these students to learn. So she put together lessons based on that. And I taught the EMD 102 course in Costa Rica, so I taught the environmental piece. Uh, we studied both at Westchester and at the Universidad Nacional in Heredia, uh, Costa Rica. And we spent three weeks there, so it was very nice. The students lived with Costa Rican families while we were there. That's the classroom that we had in the uh, Universidad Nacional. And uh, just a few images from some of the field trips we took with the students. We took them to a farmer's market. Boy, what a great way to think about language, to think about culture, and to think about the environment. And of course, we tried all the tropical fruits. Some were really great, uh, some not so much. Uh, and uh, we visited uh, other uh, rainforests um, in the La Selva Preserve in Costa Rica, which is in north central Costa Rica. Uh, I always take students to these kind of places. Pat likes to joke that I've taken her all over the world and I've shown her sewage treatment plants all over the world. <laughs> so it's not your most scenic thing to look at, but it's part of what we do. So we're looking at uh, a recycling center on campus. We visited a geothermal power plant that, you know, along the Mirabais volcano in North <coughs> Costa Rica. Uh, I took them to a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> That's uh, present in most of these slides. Uh, we visited another classroom of students. And we showed them, uh, we took them to a sustainable agriculture demonstration. We're looking at, uh, this 
was actually tied to a restaurant, so the cows were later sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I then had the opportunity in the same year, that was a busy year, 2008, in the same year I had the opportunity to uh, travel with two of my colleagues, Wei Wei Kai from the College of Education, uh, Go Paul Sankman from our uh, Department of Health, and me. So we taught uh, another six credit course during the summer. This was a two week travel course uh, with lessons on either end uh, back at Westchester. Wei Wei taught the education piece, Go Paul taught the health piece. Uh, with some traditional and non-traditional uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, and I talk the environment piece. So here's our group uh, in Beijing at a sewage treatment plant. And it's a state-of-the-art sewage treatment plant. It, I've got to tell you, it's nicer than anything I've ever seen in the U.S. But this was 2008. It was June, and the Olympics were in, in Beijing in August of 2008. So they really had their their spit polish on for the for the Olympics and. Uh, what they told us was part of the deal was with the Olympic Committee, you want to have the Olympics, you need to upgrade your water treatment game. So uh, this was, this is a, I think a very positive outcome about having the Olympics in, in different locations and different venues. Uh, we took them to the Three Gorges Dam. Now I wanted to go to the Three Gorges Dam. It's, a, it's, it's an environmental thing, okay? It's the largest dam in the world. I meant to look this stat up and I didn't get a chance to. I think there's more concrete in this dam than there is in, you know, name eight or ten really big things, okay? You don't know the exact statistic, but uh, our exercise for that day was to go to the Three Gorges Dam, see it, and to experience going from the upper pool to the Yangtze River at the lower level. So that's about a 600-foot drop. We went through the locks. It took us about two hours to lock through the Three Gorges Dam. Each lock dropped about 150 feet. So it's a really phenomenal uh, structure, and here's one of the uh, Chinese river boats, and they were interested in us, who are all these uh, people on this little boat, and we were interested in them, who are all these people on this boat. We got to see the Terracotta Warriors in Xi'an. Uh, we visited the Forbidden City. This is another one of my graduate students. Jessica got her master's degree with me. And this is my senior colleague, Dr. Gopal Sankaran. <laughs> Now, I always say that, and he doesn't laugh, but he should. Because Bill Paul is my senior colleague by one semester. He came in spring of 89, and I came in fall of 89. I always call him my senior colleague. But uh, what a wonderful man. He's been, a, he's been an inspiration to me. He was my first office mate at Westchester University. Uh, I think we've been fast friends for, uh, ever since. I wish he could be here tonight. His wife, Andrea, is here tonight. but. Uh, Andrew, you'll have to tell him that I said nice things about it. <laughs> but don't let it go to his head. <laughs> On to service now. So how do we give back to the community? And uh, this was one of my favorite service activities. Uh, we had a program for a number of years at Westchester called Rising Juniors. And what we did in that program was we took some selected high school students, students who had some who were identified by their teachers as, as having college aptitude, coming from underrepresented schools, and uh, we wanted them to experience college life as they entered their junior year so that we could uh, somehow maybe convince them that college was in their future. And so we brought them to uh, campus, they, they lived in dormitories, they ate dorm food, they attended some college classes, they had all kinds of new experiences, and one of them was an overnight camping trip and then a uh, uh, aquatic science trip to Lake Lackawack in the Poconos. So my job, my role in this was to uh, do the science education piece on, at Lake Lackawack in the Poconos. So we designed these wonderful lessons where the students would go out and collect samples, but we found that probably one of the biggest challenges was rowing the boat. <laughs> How do you get from the shore out in the middle of the lake where Dr. Short is waiting for you with all these great lessons? and? Uh, so uh, usually after wandering around and spending this, uh, some of them got there pretty quickly, others not so quick. Uh, but they all had smiles on their face when they got there. They did some sampling along the shores of the lake. They did some uh, deep water sampling in the lake. Um, some of them enjoyed it more than others. And then we brought them into this porch area on this building at, at Lake Lackawack. And we just did just a sort of a visual examination of some of the invertebrate insects that they found. And uh, so uh, it was a, basically an observational experience for them, but uh, it was a lot of fun to teach. I did it for probably four or five years. I did this work with uh, some kinesiology faculty members 
Uh, I worked with John Haley on this. I worked with uh, Chuck Pagano on this. Chuck Pagano is long retired from Westchester. Uh, Frank Fry is a recent retiree from uh, the kinesiology department. Those three faculty members in particular um, were kind of instrumental in working with these rising junior students. And that was a that was great. I, I was sad to see that program go, but it's it's no longer operating. Another service activity that I got involved in, uh, again because of my colleague John Helian. So here's John uh, with a whole bunch of spackle on here. This is this is really how this man looks. You know, don't look at him tonight. This is how he really looks. <laughs> Uh, so I want to say thank you, John, for getting me involved in one of the service activities that I think I still think of very much as one of the highlights of my career here at Westchester. Thank you, John. We had two sites that I worked on. One was in Alabama. So here's our group one year on our way to Alabama, and we stopped at the state line so we know where we were. And then uh, the other uh, team area that we worked in was in Swan Quarter, North Carolina, which is very much on the eastern uh, shore of North Carolina. And both of these were areas that were impacted heavily by hurricanes. The Alabama work was primarily in response to Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Uh, the early North Carolina work was in response largely to Hurricane Irene, which pushed water up the Pamlico Sound and, and flooded coastal properties in North Carolina. And we rebuilt people's homes, we cleaned up uh, debris, we did electrical work, we did plumbing work, we hung drywall, we tore down drywall, we put on roofs. Um, so uh, I have to mention this because I thought about this and said, how oh, am I going to do this? I might get emotional. Uh, I was on a roof like this during one of our trips when John, who was there, he called me down off the roof. He said, Chuck, i got some bad news for you. He said, your mom just died. So I was doing a service trip when my mom passed away. And John was the one who gave me the news, and you know, again, very supportive man, important man in my life. Um, so I came down off the roof, and then I went to my mother's funeral. These are some of the wonderful young people that worked with us. Uh, a couple of my students here. I have Jessica Duffy. Jessica is uh, currently working, I think, at West in the area. Susan Roche is here tonight. Um, uh, this is, gosh, I'm drawing blank. Sorry. This is uh, Kate. Uh, Kate Leonard. Kate Leonard, thank you. <laughs> okay. And then Tom Powell. And uh, so some of the work that we did on roofs and uh, cleaning up wet things. And so it just it was it was a very neat experience. That these students uh, came on these service trips with us, uh, always during the winter break, and uh, they actually paid money to go and help other people. So it was really cool. We all paid into a kitty, and that provided our food and our transportation, and it bought some supplies to do this kind of relief work. Well, I have to mention also, uh, I got a couple family members involved in that. My wife Pat came one year, and my daughter Jalissa came one year. So, uh, John, uh, did you have both your daughters there, or just one? Uh, Chelsea came for several years. Chelsea came for several years. Okay, good. All right. Some of the other service work I've done over the years has been with the Chester County Department of Emergency Services. Um, and uh, so I taught a number of emergency preparedness classes. And the county was always uh, very supportive and very sharing with their resources. Here we see uh, uh, Ed Atkins. He's the former director of uh, Chester County Department of Emergency Services. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, some other uh, folks from the county showing us the hazardous materials equipment. And they brought our students into the emergency planning center for the county and shared their expertise. Um, through them and through other friends, I met uh, one of our faculty members who's teaching with us now, Steve Kellner, and Steve's here tonight. Um, so last little bit of service here. Um, stream, stream side stormwater work. I didn't find all the pictures I wanted to put on here, but mostly what I'm showing you are pictures of work related, uh, work that is closely associated with the Brandywine Creek so that we can achieve some level of protection and cleanup. Uh, in the lower left is a group along with Aqua PA, a local water company, uh, where we did a canoe trip down the Brandywine and did some cleanup. And somewhere buried in all that is me and a couple of the environment hall students. The whole front row is Westchester students. They're from all different programs. Um, this image up here is from a few years ago doing a tree planting project on campus. Uh, these three pictures right here are from Tuesday, this week. So as part of my stormwater management class, we connected with the Brandywine Red Clay Alliance, which is a local watershed group. 
and we went out and planted 80 trees along the Black Horse Run, which is a little stream that runs from Everhart Park in Westchester down to the Brandywine. Uh, and we got a beautiful day for it. It was like 80 degrees outside and sunny, and the students would much rather be doing that than sitting in a classroom listening to me. So uh, that was a service project that we just completed. Okay, we're almost done here. So uh, people always say, oh, you're going to retire. What's next? Well, here's what's next. It's my five-point plan. Okay. I'm a planner, so my five points are family, travel, some additional service, I want to grow in my music, and obviously outdoor recreation. So I thought I'd show you a couple images of what I hope to be doing. Okay. Um, I, this is my family. Okay. Uh, just I, I don't know why I put a picture of my pond in there. I got a little pond. Of course, I'm mixing music and, and pond here. Um, we have two dogs. I have uh, a wonderful son and a wonderful daughter. And uh, I thought I'd zero in on them a little bit more. But of course, uh, I wouldn't be here without uh, my wonderful wife back. Happy to stand up, please. <laughs> my rock. She has, she has seen me through thick and thin. Uh, this year, we'll celebrate 40 years of marriage. My son Matthew and his fiancée Rachel, they're here tonight. And my daughter Teresa and her boyfriend Gerard. So, they're going to occupy some of my time, as they have all my life and will continue to. Got a little bit of science in them too. We went down to Philadelphia and we did the uh, walk for science. And so uh, my son and uh, future daughter-in-law are there uh, with Pat and I. And uh, this is my daughter, Jalissa, who was finishing her PhD in geology in Syracuse at the time. This is Dr. Short, who is an adjunct professor of geology at Westchester University. <laughs> so we're going to take our little travel. We're going to hit the road. Uh, this summer we're starting out with a two-month trip to Canada. We're going to drive to Newfoundland and uh, spend some time uh, in the Golden Park. Now, this is a service project of mine that I've been working on for, uh, I guess, maybe about the last three or four years. I collect old bicycles. So if you have any old bicycles, I don't have any room in my basement now, so hang on to them. Uh, but I've got about 12 to 15 of them right now. And uh, what my goal is, is to take, you know, it's a reuse as a goal. It's, it's, it's a sustainable effort, I think. Uh, take an item that somebody no longer needs and put it in the hands of someone who can use it. Uh, so far I've given away, I guess, about half a dozen, so I've got a few more to give away. But I just uh, take that bicycle, I go through, I re-grease everything, I uh, true the wheels, I put uh, new tires and tubes on them if they need it, uh, adjust all the cables. The most important thing, though, is make sure the brakes work. I always taught my kids when they were little, it's more important to be able to stop than it is to go. Um, so they're not new bikes, so nobody, it's not something you're going to put under a Christmas tree or, or give away for a birthday present, um, but it gets safe and dependable transportation into people's hands. Uh, I've donated several through uh, Noelson Cherry's church. Some of you know Noelson, he worked for the uh, College of Health Sciences for a number of years. Um, so if you have any suggestions for anybody you know that's needy that could use a bicycle like this, uh, or if you have any parts or bicycles that you know I would need, I'll take those. Just not immediately. <laughs> okay, music. Um, I, had to, I had to title this slide more tuba. Because, and I've got to tell you a funny story. So I'm in graduate school. I'm playing this little community band. Oh, God. And uh, there's my wife in the audience, and it was a small group, and every time the music got quiet, she and this other friend of mine there would yell, More tuba! More tuba! <laughs> Which, of course, if you play in an ensemble, you're supposed to blend in, and here's this woman out there yelling more tuba. <laughs> But a couple members of my brass quintet are here tonight, and I'm glad to see them. John is Stephanie, John's on trumpet, Stephanie's on horn, uh, Ted's on trombone, Mike couldn't make it, and that's me on two in the back. And I thought I would maybe share with you a little bit what that sounds like. So, this is something we recorded uh, probably a year or so ago. So, I'll play a little bit of this clip.
some music. <laughs> I've also had the opportunity to play uh, for a number of years. Oh, sorry Stephanie, I meant to uh, <laughs> ask for that one note, okay? <laughs> Recordings can be so cool. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to play with the uh, Chester County Concert Band, and so I'm one of these students back here for, I think this is my 24th year with the Chester County Concert Band. Uh, it's, it's just been just a wonderful uh, uh, passion of mine. I also got the chance to play on the stage at the Kimmel Center with uh, some members of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Now that really sounds like way more than it is. They invite the public to come do that. I wasn't personally invited. But still, it's a lot of fun to play on that amazing stage and that amazing venue. So uh, music is one of those things you can always get better at. So that's a goal of mine is to get better at it. And I've got to go play some more. So I'll be in my kayak. I'll be on uh, sailing with my friends in the Newcastle Sailing Club. Um, maybe a little more than we do now. A lot more than we do now. <laughs> or bicycling. Uh, Pat and I love to go hit rail trails. It's kind of a goal of mine to maybe try to get on every rail trail in Pennsylvania. There are quite a few. So that's, a, that's an ambitious goal there. So we'll do more cycling in the future. And that brings me to my final slide. I don't have a long conclusion slide, but I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I really thought about this closing. Uh, my dad offered me some advice when I left to go to college uh, about 45 years ago. He said, find something you love to do. You're going to spend a long time doing it, and it will be a major part of your life. So with that said, uh, to my WCU family, I could not have asked for a better something to do. Could not have done it without it. So thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart.